Um, all right. Hey, guys. This is Coach Talks, episode six. And we have Matt on the podcast now. And we have Joel on the podcast as well. So it's nice to have three of us. Um, and today we're just going to quickly go over, uh, well, not quickly, but we're going to go over what Matt does um, in terms of training, lifting, uh, and YouTube as well. Uh, and just to touch on a few lifting topics uh, at the moment, and then a few questions at the end. So I think to start off with, we'll just do a little update on ourselves, and then Matt can introduce himself, who he is, what he does, etc. So, Joe, do you want to start? Yeah, that sounds good. Um, I'll say, I don't know how long, I don't, when do we upload the last episode? So I don't know how long it would be in between. Um, in a bit. Not much has really happened again, obviously in the spirit of lockdown. Things have stayed fairly similar. Um, one of the biggest sort of changes to myself is um, in sort of the spirit of lockdown, I, I sort of wanted to do something not good, but like almost give back. So I've sort of changed my training around. Um, I've taken sort of a step back from the resistance bands, the weights and everything. And I'm actually running the length of Hadrian's Wall um, for Macmillan Cats Sport, um, which obviously... I'm raising money for it, so I will drop the link in the description if anyone would like to donate. Um, it's 145 kilometers. Uh, you know, I'm aiming to sort of hit about 5k a day. Um, maybe some longer runs in in the mix. So I should be done by the end of May. Oh, if everything goes to plan. Um, with that in mind, nothing else has really changed. Sort of diet, food has come back up a little bit. I'm not. Um, tracking as much now so actually well, to be honest i'm not tracking at all so sort of just you know visually just gauging what my food is where my food is sort of what my weight is and then how that affects my running um yeah to be honest that's that's pretty much all that's new with me that's interesting nice um yeah i mean i've pushed up in weight slightly um i was on i still am on a bulk uh, come up to heaviest today at 101.7 so i'm getting heavy um but no training is going well um progressing in most things and yeah really really, really nice and if you want to introduce yourself matt um obviously yeah. you haven't been on the podcast before but uh some of you may know matt through youtube or through instagram phoenix fitness um but yeah take it away Cool. Yeah. So I'm Matt, and uh, yeah, like Joel said, I've got a YouTube channel and an Instagram called Phoenix Fitness, um, which primarily looks at my training and sort of it's everyday life stuff. So what I'm eating, that sort of thing. But uh, I think it's it's sort of more to do with uh, helping people as well. So it is, if be that through sort of entertainment um, or just um, trying to offer support as well. So just giving some general advice as well. Um, so that's what the channel is really primarily about. Um, so professionally, I work for the NHS and I actually used to work for Macmillan as well, which is so it's awesome to hear that Joe's running for them. Um, but now working as a therapy assistant uh, with learning disabilities. So that's what I do sort of as a job. Um, so yeah, that's kind of me. Just uh, started powerlifting probably five years ago. Um, me and Joel did our first competition together. What was it, 2000? 15, 16? It was a long time ago, but um, yeah, we've competed together is it just once yeah. or we competed twice. Uh, it was Cheltenham, wasn't it? So yeah, maybe once, um, or maybe, maybe once or twice. Um, okay, nice. Um, so obviously we competed together a couple of times. So I just want to touch on why you compete. Why did you get into powerlifting? What was your, um, what was the reasoning for it? Um, I think just a, a little bit lucky, really, because I was just training, just going into the gym uh, normally, like I think a lot of people do, just get a gym membership, and I was doing just the general uh, biceps and, you know, not really having any idea what I was doing. Um, and then I bumped into a couple of people that just happened to do powerlifting, um, and they just sort of introduced themselves. They um, just ran me through a few movements, like the deadlift and everything, and I just sort of said, do you, you know, what, what are these useful for? And then they told me about powerlifting and how they compete in it. So that's where I was first introduced to it. So then from there on, really, I was just um, obsessed with it, really, and loved it. And then, I don't know, skip ahead maybe a couple of years, decided to sign up to my first competition. Um, and, yeah, it's from there, really got the bug. Um, why I compete, I don't 
I don't really know. I think I suppose it is just. Um, well, I think once you actually do your first competition, you realise how much that actually pushes you forward in your training as well. That's why I always recommend people actually do compete for the first time because the amount of experience that you get from competing um, really does push your training forward. I find. Yeah, hundred percent. You have that fixed goal, and you can just mm. you, you you have that end date, and you have to achieve a certain goal by that date um, instead of just setting a few gym goals. Um, that's really nice. Um, obviously, that's that's quite actually quite similar to me when I started powerlifting. Got in the gym. You, you like you said, the there's normal kind of. I'm going to get in the gym. I'm going to get big, big chest, big arms. Like that's that's the teenager's dream. Um, but yeah, got into it and then started enjoying more strength style training. Enjoyed doing kind of one rep max every session, um, and then realised I could compete. So it was yeah, it was good fun to be able to do that. And um, obviously, we've both been under uh, Ben Glasscock um, as our coach for a bit, a little bit, which was quite good fun. Um, do you still get coached by Ben? Yep, I do, yeah. So with the Strength yeah. Movement, his, his company, and uh, with Ben, yeah. So I've been with him probably two years now, maybe just over two years. Oh, nice. Okay. Um, and it, it's quite an interesting point, obviously, talking about um, kind of our why for why we train. Obviously, I've shifted slightly from powerlifting to bodybuilding, um, and the why being... I love powerlifting, but I'm not strong enough. I'm not big enough. Um, and to really be devoted to bodybuilding in the meanwhile, then eventually help my powerlifting is kind of the reasoning why I do my training. Um, but yeah, interesting talking to you, Joe. Um, obviously, you've just completely changed what you're doing. You're, you're running now. Um, I know you've done running in the past, but yeah, you've, you've done all sorts of things. Um, so it's quite interesting just to see obviously yeah. the reasons why people do things yeah no i mean so i'm i've never really like no offense i've never really been invested into the powerlifting sort of side of things um you know just like the training and everything it never really took my fancy um so sort of when i was training obviously i i sort of fell into that you know arms chest sort of workout same as pretty much every teenage guy did i can imagine um and then uh, as training progressed, I you know started finding all these different training splits, etc. Then I went under the coaching of Josh Bridgman. Um, well, that would must have been the last year of college, um, and he sort of introduced me to the you know the lower volume, higher intensity sort of training, and I sort of fell in love with that. Um, and you know the whole bodybuilding thing um, has really has really taken my fancy. The reason I sort of never competed in there is purely just because I've not been big enough um, and I've not wanted to compete enough to put myself through the sort of the rigorous contest prep um, diets and everything. And then, I mean, moving on to sort of now, um, why I've sort of taken a step back from that is not that I'm not enjoying it. I still, obviously I still do enjoy it. Um, and I will go back to training. I always will love training that way. Um, the purely the reason why I've started this complete opposite change in, you know, into running, um, and you know, within the forthcoming months, I probably will do more long distance based events, whether it's cycling, running or, or something like that. You know, there's a couple on there that I really would like to do for good charities like Macmillan, et cetera. Um, but the reason behind that is, is really just because I fancy doing something different. Um, and in this sort of situation that we're all in now where we can't go out and we can't, um, you know, you can't go to Hadrian's Wall, etc. I've got a treadmill in the garage, so I'm still sort of under the, that lockdown, um, the rules and everything. You know, I'm not going out for more than an hour a day. But sort of if I can do something to almost give back in, in the spirit of lockdown, um, that's what really sort of... Um, tickle my fancy for that so yeah I guess I guess that's kind of my why but, yeah yeah no that's quite interesting I think it's, it's it's very interesting seeing people with a a why for potentially the feeling the sensation of just doing exercise so you are doing training you enjoy training no matter kind of what the training obviously there's certain things that you probably won't like um but you've done a whole different lot of stuff and you you enjoy switching it up which is interesting because i know for myself i okay changing up every once in a while is nice but a complete change like that i would not be able to cope with i mm. 
really enjoyed the passion behind kind of lifting weights. Um, and that's definitely my focus instead of just the overall training side of things. Um, I don't know about you, Matt, do you, do you enjoy the kind of, would you be able to do something different and still enjoy it just the same or? Yeah, I mean, I think during this lockdown, I've been trying to do different stuff just to sort of dip my toes into different types of training. So I have, I've been doing a lot more cycling now. So just doing um, a bit of cardio, I've done those sort of 5k runs and things like that. And I am enjoying those, but I think with powerlifting, um, for me in particular, it's, it's a very mental sport. Um, and it's a sport where you can let out a massive amount of sort of aggression, I suppose, in a very short sort of period of time. So I didn't really fancy doing something like boxing because I didn't want to get punched in the face. So short of doing boxing, powerlifting is just this thing where you can actually take your aggression out on something which isn't going to punch you back. So yeah. it's like that really. So I think, um, I don't know, maybe just chip on my shoulder about sort of events in life and things like that. And I think powerlifting, just, you know, stepping up to a heavy deadlift there's no better way of just getting rid of a load of frustration so for me i think that's ultimately my why why i chose powerlifting um and why yeah i've just been drawn to it i think yeah 100 percent. That, that's that's really cool um do we want to touch slightly on youtube obviously we have the podcast on youtube i know joe you've used youtube in the past you've um done yeah, a few videos yeah. and matt is pretty consistent with it um <laughs> doing well Annoying. So, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I've, was, I've been doing YouTube for quite a few years now. Um, and ultimately, it's just because I, I love doing it because I just love trying to create um, videos. So along, alongside powerlifting, editing and creating videos is one of my passions. So um, I think being able to combine those two things um, is great, really. And if I can then try and send a positive message within the videos as well i think it's just a win-win so yeah it's just one of my passions something that i really enjoy doing yeah of course i know you touched on uh before whether it's on videos or instagram but no you may not be the strongest power lifter in the world um and i know a lot of people get attention because they're the best of the best um but i love what you do it's, it's kind of a mix of everything it's it's the i do lift um and i do well um but also i'm also just like you guys you know i i, I eat i train um i joke about and it's nice to have a mix um in that which is quite it's, i think on this podcast especially it's quite nice to yeah okay we want to educate people um but I think it's also quite nice to have a bit more of a just a, a bit of downtown that downtime for some people, just so they can listen to a podcast and it doesn't have to be that intense amount yeah. of information all the time, and you can kind of just listen to people chat. Um, yeah, I think I'm yeah, just nice. as well because I realise that I'm not, you know, if, unless I'm going to go and hop on some steroids, I realise that I'm not going to be the strongest person. There's no point in sort of trying to fake it and pretend like I am going to be the strongest person. So I might as well be realistic and self-aware of what I am so mm. I think it's, it's more relatable as well I suppose to, to people as well because I think nine out of ten people aren't going to be a world champion so you know embrace who you are I suppose yeah I know a lot of um you've kind of I, I know one of the reasons I watch your videos is just, it, it looks quite cool um mm. you've definitely got into it so much that you are getting better at it um and the edits and little little things like that have been quite nice um, yeah i kind of see it as almost a challenge within myself as well like a bit like in the gym where i'm chasing pbs i'm kind of chasing how can i make this edit even better than the last one so it's it's just natural progression i think you know every every human being has that in them where they want to better themselves and i think i just do it in the videos as well as in the gym yeah i'm sure it's been something nice for you to spend a bit more time on now yeah. that we're in lockdown as well um obviously joe and i've started a podcast which is really cool um it's not very often uh, once a week but it is something to do it is something quite nice to focus on um so i'm sure how, how often do you get your youtube videos out again well uh, <laughs> twice a week so i normally there's one out today so as we're recording this it's going out of five, but it's nice. normally afternoon five o'clock and sunday afternoon uh five cool. o'clock. twice a week if i can um i've been fairly consistent with that for the last few months but Sometimes if there's literally nothing to film or I just don't want to, it does happen. Sometimes I don't want to film then a, mm. a video, but most yeah. of the time 
for like filming so right cool um shall we dive into eddie and thor um it's quite a juicy topic yeah um so for those of you who don't know eddie got the 500 deadlift back in 2016 i think um and thor recently in the past week has pulled 501 um seems a little bit petty just to get a one kilo record that that is that is the sport it it doesn't matter how much it is by um but got a 501 deadlift in a competition but it's in his home gym which is where all the controversy is at um eddie calling out thor for calling him a cheat um in world's strongest man lots of tension um for it then to be followed by an interview with thor who then challenges eddie to a boxing fight and it's like wh- why um yeah, isn't it it's not- yeah it's almost as if they they planned it yeah. um they they planned the fake tension um to yeah. gather all this kind of this this attention back to eddie obviously he's kind of he stepped away from strongman again um stepped away from deadlifts and he still trains obviously he's got more of his youtube and his business now but bringing more attention back to him bringing attention to thor and the combination of that i think there's definitely something going on it's very um, odd yeah yeah what are your um thoughts on that matt first off should we start off with what, what were your thoughts on the deadlift oh class like it it you know it was always going to happen um just seeing how his training's been going like he's definitely strong enough for it i think genetically he's a better deadlifter than eddie i think eddie has to put a lot of energy to get to so when he got his 500 he had to put so much into that whereas thor seemed to just sort of get himself nicely hyped up and just he you know lifted it fairly comfortably i think Mm -hmm. if sort of adrenaline and um intensity that eddie had he could be lifting sort of 520 um and yeah i think he, he made it look easy really and that's what I was doing. from from my sort of view on it when I watched I will say I watched back the video I didn't catch it live but I watched it pretty much soon after it was uploaded and it was all ready um I I saw it I saw I I won't lie I did skip over it and just go straight to the 501 I didn't watch the warm ups but um it did look easy yeah yeah mm. it's interesting cuz there's a lot of I know the 500 is is the, is very big. Um, I think everyone can under uh, understand that. But if you relate it back to a one that Max you do in the gym, I think if you're just building up week by week, and eventually you just get there, you know, it's nothing. You're just casually building up, kind of that linear progression. Um, obviously, not it's not always linear, but that I think having a mindset where it just oh next week I'm doing this, next week I'm doing this, and it. You just trust the program. Yeah. I think there's less stress and worry about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. But then right. there's also the argument about it, it was in his home gym. You know, he's comfortable. Um, he's he's at home in his own gym, not just a gym that he trains at in his in his personal gym. Um, and he pulled the record. You know, it's it's very very strange. Um, but is it being standard as a world record? Have they actually said it's going to be a world record now? I don't know. I'm I, I'm not 100 percent sure. We should probably <laughs> find that out. But because um, it's definitely it's definitely an unofficial world record because no one's pulled five. Well, no one that's filmed it and put it in, on social media has pulled 501. But yeah in competition no one has so whether it's depending what the ruling is i think it's definitely unofficial i think it is official because they they weighed everything well yeah and they had the referees they had the referees they weighed everything and it wouldn't be that publicized if it wasn't official um i think on the event i think so okay yeah and obviously um yeah obviously the, the, the the Attempt after that would have been 520, um, which is ridiculous, and I definitely don't think he had that in him. Um, no. But no, it's interesting, very interesting, especially the, the, the post interview um, with Thor. So there was a post interview on the live stream. Um, if none of you have watched that, then you probably should. It's a bit odd. 
Um, but it's it's a very it, it's a verbal attack. It is a literal verbal attack. So the host of the um, the competition, I think it's core strength or something like that. Um, essentially, he was like Eddie has been given the contract as well, a seven figure contract, um, where if he accepts, then they go they have a fight um, and a lot of trash talk between the two of them um, on social media, which is very interesting. But um, do you think it's real? Like the, the anger between them, or I think, what, what I do you think, think? There's a sort of underlying animosity there because of World Strongest Man, because mm. this is like going obviously back to World Strongest Man times when Thor, you know, called Eddie a cheat and everything. So there was, there's always been tension, but I think they've both seen an opportunity to make some money out of the sport because ultimately you don't get paid that much in Strongman. I mean, you probably get paid more than most people, but compared to other, you know, top athletes, you're not getting paid a ridiculous amount of money. So if someone's going to say, you know, if you can hype up this fight and actually make it worthwhile, we'll put in um, a million pounds to pay for this. So obviously you're going to then start fighting at each other to try and promote it. So it, it, financially it makes sense. So I think from a business point of view, it's clever, but from a strength point of view and a strength fan base point of view, I think it's a bit farcical. And um, mm. yeah, you don't, I, cause I, I wouldn't say I'm like a, a, a strong man purist, but I'm a bit more than a casual fan. And I, it was, I didn't feel very comfortable when, Thor started calling out Eddie at the end now. I just thought it then became a bit of a joke. And it's yeah. all like what he just did, he should have been just focusing on the deadlift. And then it was almost he was just using that to then make loads of money. So yeah. It just became and a I, bit I just want to touch on that, but like another reason of it being in his home gym, he's comfortable. I I think if that was at a normal competition with other competitors. Um, like it was with Eddie's attempt. It wasn't just Eddie there. It was other competitors who would attempt the same weights. Um, he wouldn't go on the microphone afterwards with a huge, huge audience and no. talk shit. He wouldn't do that um, because there'd be so much negativity towards that. But I think because it was in his home gym, mm. it was just like, well, what are you going to do about it? It's online, you know? Um, I mean, it's very, very odd. Yeah, I'm just going just going back to that the, your competition point. I mean, I think it actually at a competition, I don't know. Obviously, you guys have competed in powerlifting competitions. I've done competitions in sort of other things, um, not weight related. But I, I think personally, from my point of view, that could have swung either way. Like either Thor would have gone in that there at World Strongest Man, a competition, you know that's got hundreds, if not thousands of people in the audience that are taping him, et cetera. He will have either had, you know, massive anxiety walking up to that platform and not been able to pull 501, or he would have used the adrenaline as fuel and maybe gone on to pull 510. Mm. Um, so that would have, you know, that would have made a difference at competition there. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, I completely agree with uh, both of you on, on both of your points there. I don't think he would have said anything if it was at World Strongest Man because there would have been a lot of ruckus at that competition there. Um, and then, like you said, Matt, <clears throat> I think I think the tension is real, obviously, between them. Um, and you could tell that way before the attempt sort of even happened over Instagram and sort of Facebook and stuff. I think the argument is business. Mm. I think you know, where they've stemmed from, you know, the after interview, even Eddie Hall's video when he sort of explained why he was um why he was signing the contract with his world's strongest man um trophy in the background. Yeah. Um, I think all of that was completely business related. Like there's there's it just seemed a little bit fake for my liking. Yeah. But you can also you, I mean, if someone offers you a million pounds, yeah. you do want to stand to <laughs> Cool, you know, you'd be called a sellout. It just, you know, what's more important, you like your integrity or providing for your family, I suppose, because that's what it kind of comes down to. And yeah, again, strongman isn't isn't a long sport. You you are putting your body to its absolute limits. Um, you saw what it did to Eddie. Um, it didn't do it to Thor, but um, yeah, I'm sure I'm sure Thor's pretty. Well, it, it doesn't actually look like he's pretty wrecked. Obviously, you are going to be very fatigued from it, but nowhere near as much as Eddie was. Um, but no, it's, it's interesting because obviously I think before the deadlift attempt, Thor was 
definitely um, talking negatively about Eddie. Same coming back, but um, I know you talked about a, bu a business point of view. It's negatively uh, talking about that individual. They are the, the, their business is themselves um, for for the majority of it. I assume um, they they get um, sponsorships and stuff based on who they are and what they've done. Um, so I think if then one person starts calling the other person a cheat and nothing comes back, um, there's no reason to not believe that. Um, so then you just, your business comes down as a result of that. Um, and the, the anger might actually come from there. You, you're ruining my business. Um, how dare you ruin this? And then it all comes through and maybe the anger is real. Yeah. Um, Questioning his integrity, isn't it? I suppose. And yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Anything yeah. else we want to touch on there? <laughs> I'll just quickly touch on something that Joe was talking about just in competition and sort of whether it, being in a competition would help or not. Um, I think for a lot of people, it kind of depends whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. So do you like having eyes on you and um, are you just a bit more expressive? And I think in those surroundings, you thrive. So being in a competition will probably do you good. But if you're like more of an introvert, being in front of a big crowd is probably your worst nightmare. You know, you don't want to do something like that. But I think generally strong men are more extroverts anyway. So being in front of a crowd, I think they thrive off that anyway. And that's, you know, maybe being a bit um, judgmental. But I think generally being in a crowd would help them because I think it would just draw more adrenaline to them but then you have the disadvantage of not obviously lifting when you want to lift not having the rest times you want to have um different equipment and all the rest of it so i think that's the main disadvantage from being a, in a competition mm. rather than the sort of crowd that's good. yeah definitely okay <laughs> um i think we'll move on from that um and maybe go through a few questions. Yeah, I mean, just before, um, just we get into any questions or whatnot, Matt, did you just want to talk about the Facebook group that you mentioned earlier with us? If I could, that'd be great. Um, yeah. so sort of as part of my YouTube, um, I've had um, people sort of reach out to me and sort of message me and people that are going through sort of tough times. And I've had um, someone reach out to me recently. He's a good friend of mine. Um, and he'd lost his mum recently. So I just, he wanted me to put this on my YouTube channel. Um, so I just talked about that a little bit. Um, and it's prompted me to make a Facebook group uh, called Good Grief. And it simply is just a support network for people that um, have lost a loved one um, and just need a little bit of support. And it's um, a private group. So there's no, it's not going to be just like anyone can join. It's just a place where I've got um, some resources that people can look through. Um, just to sort of help them deal with their grief at the moment because it's something that's very difficult and a lot of people find difficult to talk about um, especially like young men because um, I have experience of losing a loved one when I was younger um, and it's very difficult to talk about it sometimes um, but that being said the group is open to everybody um, but I think just from my own experience I know it's difficult to talk about that sometimes so um, I just encourage anyone that is going through a difficult time and maybe has lost a loved one um, you can head over to the group um, and then there's myself there. Uh, ben, my coach, is part of the group as well and he's actually offering um, some um, fitness stuff as well, so some templates to help with that If because um, I know for me fitness was a good way of dealing with that as well, so he, he's actually going to help contribute with that as well. Um, so yeah, if anyone feels like they, they need that, then um, you can contact me and I can send you the link and yeah, you can just have a chat on there. Yeah, yeah, and you know, guys, like, um, whenever we get a guest on, we'll always put all of their, you know, Instagrams, Facebooks, all of the stuff in the bio in case you, any of you want to check it out. So we'll, we'll definitely make sure to include that sort of in the link below. Thank you. Thanks, mate. Amazing. I think also <clears throat> it's something that people can use after all of this corona. It's not. It's not specific to the situation. Oh, yeah. It's another way for people to deal with things obviously currently you are generally just seeing your family people who you live with um and there's no way for you to go and see someone else or do something else to cope with that and i think 
even after lockdown is over, um, people can go out. I think it's also just an, it's just an extra way for people to express how they're feeling. Um, yeah. which, is, I, which is really nice. The point of it really is the fact that you'll have a lot of people that are going through the same thing. Um, and people that are more relatable to yourself. So sometimes you can't talk to your family members because they might be grieving in a completely different way to you. Um, so for example, when I lost my dad when I was 18, I, I felt like I couldn't really talk to my mum or my sister because they were kind of grieving in a slightly different way to me. Um, I was sort of then put in a position of man of the house because I was the, the eldest boy at that point. Um, and I felt that was like quite a lot of pressure on me. Um, and I couldn't really talk to family about it, but and I didn't have a support network around me um, to discuss the way I was feeling about stuff. Luckily, I had powerlifting and that sort of stuff where I was able to get rid of some of that built-in frustration. But to be able to actually just talk to other people about it, I think, is a very useful tool, which is why, obviously, we've made the group. Um, so, yeah. 100%. Okay, so we're just going to quickly go through some questions. Um, some of them, obviously, you put up the question box and you don't really get many, but some we do have a few genuine comments. Um, so the first question is talking about trap bar deadlifts and whether to use the high bar handle or the low bar handle in terms of range of motion and kind of the effects that that might have. Um, so wh wh what do you think about that, Joe? Um, yeah, I mean... Personally, uh, I don't use the track bar. Um, I never have used the track bar. You know, I know. I, th I think it's an amazing bit of kit, um, and I, I never have used it, um, which is probably on me. But that's all right. Um, the, from my own opinion, the only bar we've got over at my gym is a high a high handle one, um, and you know, I as much as it probably does make a difference um you know with range of motion etc i would still think that um you know if you get a better connection um with you know your posterior chain using potentially the lower one than you do with the higher one i would go for the lower one um and vice versa as well you know if you find that using the lower bar hurts somewhere along the line and you can get a nice fluid movement that doesn't cause any issues or restrict restraints um, using the, the higher bar, I would always, you know, tell someone or um, suggest for someone to use the one that they feel they can get the best out of, um, if that makes sense. <laughs> nice. Um, from my point of view, um, I have used the trap bar before. I've always used the higher handles just because the lower handles are so much harder. <laughs> um, but in terms of a programming point of view, obviously you have less range of motion in the higher handles, um, which will put you at a stronger position um, if we're talking about deadlifts. Um, so yet yeah, you can lift more weight, which can transfer over in terms of maybe grip strength if you're wanting to train your grip slightly um, in a slightly different deadlift, then that's also a benefit that you can use um, because you can use more weight. Um, I also think if, in, if there's anybody with, say, lower back injuries or just restrictive injuries um, or just body types in general, you just maybe your, your biomechanics, your bone structure doesn't allow you to fully get down into that normal deadlift position, then instead you can go with a slightly elevated position. It's similar to doing a block pull um, or a, a small block pull. Um, but also the fact that the trap bar deadlift allows you to that allows the weight to be directly over kind of your, your center of mass, um, which is going to put a lot less through your back and maybe a little bit more through your quads um, as well. What was your, what was you, what were you going to say about that, Matt? Uh, no, I, I agree with both those things really. Again, I haven't really used the trap bar either, so I can't really comment too much about it, but I think I know from just using a low, handle setting it's going to be a bit more specific because you'll be on the same level as doing a conventional deadlift or a, a normal deadlift um, but I know just using the higher handles just will allow you to overload the movement a little bit more because you'll be able to put more weight on because you're more upright um, that's pretty much all I can really contribute on that because I don't really use it so I don't actually really that's cool. understand the biomechanics of it enough to really uh, co yeah, comment on it really no, that's cool um, I mean, okay, 
on Facebook the other day, I did see um, a bit of kit from, you know, it's a new sort of fitness company that has come out of the ground in this lockdown, selling bits of kit for ridiculously pricey prices. But it's a trap bar, it's like half trap bar, but where the handles are and then where the, you know, the surrounding bar comes in, it's all on a gyro. So the handles are free moving. So you've got like free moving grip. Okay. I saw it and I was like, I'd really want to try that. But it was yeah, that months. sounds quite quite decent. Yeah, it's, it's sort of, it, it, we, I used a lot of, when I'm over the gym, I use the D handles quite a lot to get that free range of movement through the shoulder and yeah. elbow. Um, mm. I, I just saw it and I was like, you know, I bet that would be so nice to you. Yeah. There's, um, have you heard of uh, Chris Duffin? No. Yes. He, he's Kabuki strength. He's, I don't know what his actual job is, but I think he, he's like a, a welder or something like that. And he makes his own um, kit and he's come out with um, a really good sort of hex bar. And he's always making amazing bars like that and just reminds me of him. So I'd recommend checking him out because yeah, he recently squatted like a thousand pounds for three or something. He's, Ridiculous. Oh yeah, he's, he's like the only person to squat and deadlift a thousand pounds for reps. That's it. Yeah, um, I think that was his goal. Yeah, um, yeah, it, it is pretty crazy. He's um, another example of just a guy that just uses powerlifting, you know, to sort of escape his mind a little bit. He's just very intense but ridiculously strong. Very nice. That was um, that was good. Um, specificity of sumo deadlifting outside of powerlifting and if there's any crossover that's our next topic um from my point of view i've pulled conventional i've pulled sumo um i'm now currently pulling conventional again but in terms of any crossover so that in terms of talking about sports um maybe general health i think being able to move your body under control um is the most important thing being able to hip hinge um is also a very very important skill for anyone for everyone in fact uh a lot of you see a lot of old elderly people even just kind of middle-aged people with so many back problems um and a lot of it's going to come through work just handling weights um or even just general daily objects in terms of like bags and stuff if you're if you're bent over your your lumb um, your lumbar spine is flexed and you're rotating it's it's, it's gonna it's gonna eventually cause some issues um so being able to properly hip hinge um have your back in a safer position that kind of thing if you can train that way then you're more likely going to be able to lift things that way um it's going to become kind of drilled into your uh mind so then you're naturally going to be able to pick up boxes by kind of squatting down to it straight back. Um, and people may look at you like you're a bit of a weirdo, just kind of squatting these boxes around everywhere, but um, it's going to make a difference. And I definitely think if you're, if you're someone who doesn't conventional deadlift um, or do any deadlift because of your back, then I think you need to address the issue by not avoiding, not avoiding it. Um, obviously that's not me saying you should just deadlift and your back will get better but it's something that you should be be, be working towards as something that you can do um, any kind of form of a hip hinge is, is normally quite nice mm. but in terms of specificity um, I, I definitely think conventional has more carryover um, just in terms of that ability to hip hinge it's more of a hip hinge dominant movement um, whereas the sumo deadlift is far more technical um, because not only are you using your hips in quite a, um, yeah, you not only are you using your kind of hip extension, um, but you've also got a lot to figure out um, around the hips in terms of external rotation, um, a lot more knee flexion. There's, there's so many technique points in sumo. I know Matt, you still do sumo. Um, Joe, you, you normally just do conventional. Uh, it, it, yeah, I, what, what would you be your touch on that, Matt? Um, I don't. I think specificity-wise, um, it's more. It's very specific to powerlifting, and there's not really much carryover to many other sports with sumo. I mean, with conventional, there's more carryover to other sports. I mean, arguably, you could say sort of weightlifting, Olympic weightlifting, although. 
um, more explosive, you still have to sort of do a deadlift to get before the clean and that sort of thing. But you can't do that with a sumo. So there's not many sports where you're going to be doing sumo deadlifting. So I think it's more useful from a functional point of view, like you were saying, with um, things like bad lower backs. It means you're going to be in a more upright position um, and putting le less stress on your lower back. Um, and at the end of the day, it's still a hinge movement, isn't it? Because it's yeah. although it's more upright and your legs are more spread, you still have to hinge to get the weight up. So you, st you still need hip extension um, in order to move. So you're going to be working useful muscles like your glutes and your hamstrings still. Just because you're doing sumo doesn't mean you're suddenly not working your posterior chain. You still are, which has carryover to you know other things. Um, so they're still useful movements to do, and they'll still help you build muscle. But it's just um, maybe a little bit more technical um, and probably a little bit less posterior dominant. Um, so, yeah, quite specific to powerlifting. It doesn't really carry over to many other sports, but um, still a useful movement, I think. Mm, I think it's definitely just a, a good overall movement. Eventually, maybe not to start off with, but eventually once you get down a hip hinge properly, um, yeah. it's definitely a movement potentially to try um, just to be able to actually move well, uh, to be able yeah. to coordinate your limbs in such a way that it is an efficient deadlift is very difficult. Um, one of the reasons I didn't like doing it because it spent so much time to actually get into a good position. But um, requires a lot no, of movement. Once, once you crack it, it's definitely a really good movement. Yeah, I it, it, yeah. I was just sorry. I was just going to say it's good for like working on things like your hip mobility as well because they can easy, easily be neglected. Um, if you're just doing conventional, because you don't think about opening or externally rotating your hips before you deadlift normally, so it can work on a bit of mobility as well. So. Yeah, yeah, um, I mean, I've, yeah. I've done a bit of conventional and a bit of sumo, so I, I mean, <clears throat> personally, with the sumo, I find you know I can get a very good, you know, connection to all the muscles sort of around the like pelvic girdle and you know in your hips. So you know maybe your hip flexors, your glutes, your hamstrings, etc. So I, I would, I mean, I'd agree with it being a very functional movement, like you said, Joel, but at the same time, if you can use it to strengthen, you know, muscles like your glutes, your hamstrings, potentially better than you could use it, uh, a conventional deadlift that would have some carryover for sports, um, like sprinting, running, um, rugby, football, sort of those explosive movements. Um, so there, I mean, there is some carryover, but I, again like you guys covered it is i think it again is yeah a more functional movement yeah i, th I think just in general a lot of powerlifting this might be a bit controversial i don't actually know but i think in powerlifting in general there's not much carry over to many sports anyway like no. really like heavy heavy squats that doesn't really carry over to sports you're better off doing more explosive things M maybe if you're doing like squat jumps or something but heavy squats, heavy deadlifts doesn't really carry over to anything apart from just building static strength. Yeah. Because they're very specific. Like doing a power clean or a clean and jerk, they're very coordinated, powerful movements, which will can, you know, transmit into like more horizontal force, yeah. uh, like with sprinting. But powerlifting is just very static, one planed motioned movements. So I don't know if that's controversial or against what science says, but... <laughs> Sort of no, it, it makes sense <laughs> yeah. yeah they carry over to very similar sports so your yeah obviously heavy one rep max deadlifts they that carries over to that phase one of the clean so yeah exactly and then yeah if you, if you ever in that phase of motion if you're going to be doing anything that's like requires agility then yeah. Rude. <laughs> yeah. yeah nice and finally we're going to touch on just do you guys watch any other YouTube channels? Um, maybe other than lifting stuff? Uh, do you have any kind of favorites that you like to watch? Uh, I, I probably watch a bit too much YouTube. Um, <laughs> I think just because as someone who makes like, YouTube videos, I just find it really interesting watching other people's content and maybe um, getting ideas and just sort of how, like, I'm always thinking, how did they film that or why did they do that? And, that sort of thing. But I think for, from just a pure entertainment point of view, um, I watch Max Tuning. I don't know if you've heard of him. Um, so he's like a fitness influencer, but is moving more into just like daily vlogs and that sort of thing. I've watched him for years. 
Um, and he's probably my favorite fitness YouTuber that I watch. I don't really watch much fitness YouTube anymore. Um, I used to watch um, like loads of different variety of YouTubers, but um, I've maybe lost a bit of touch with them now. And yeah, I, I don't really watch as much fitness stuff, but I also watch um, Binging with Babish, which is a cooking show. Um, <laughs> I watch Sam the Cooking Guy, who is also a cooking okay. show. So the theme is basically a lot of food stuff, really. I just watch a lot of like food channels, um, and David Dobrik, who's just like quite a well-known vlogger. I watch him as well. So that's pretty cool. much all I watch. It's nice about. having a balance between yeah, like, I, yeah, I have lifting, yeah, lifting, eating, and yeah, some a bit more eating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How about you, Joe? Yeah, I mean, I sort of I fall in that. I, you know, I watched a, I watched a lot of um, like Christian Guzman and, and Max um, just because I, I love sort of the way they edit things together, you know, the, the videography of all of their videos and stuff. So whether that's the edits they do or like just things like the drone footage they use as like, like interval breakers sort of in the videos, um, that that's more why I watch that compared to maybe the fitness side of it now. Um, yeah, and obviously really. like keeping up with Christian's business and stuff to see where he's moving next. He's always, I spoke about it when we had Nathan on, um, he's always sort of moving forward with, you know, whether it's a brand, whether it's the energy drink, whether it's his cars, whatnot. So I sort of watch a lot of that just to see what's going on with their lives, really. Um, and then, you know, maybe from a more educational standpoint, I watch, you know, a lot of Josh Bridgman. Um, I, you know, again, I like his sort of raw style of video. He doesn't really hold anything back, does he? So it's, it's just, he's very honest with the camera. He talks about what he knows about, what he doesn't know about, he doesn't pretend to know about. It's sort of that style of video. So I watch a lot of that. Um, and then, you know, the other stuff, it's, I more just use YouTube outside of that as like, if I want to know something, I just whack on a YouTube video or yeah. something like that. Like, you know, me and a couple of my mates are trying to do one of the Destiny 2 raids now on Xbox. So I watched a walkthrough video on that yesterday. So <laughs> <laughs> things like that. It's just more I use YouTube for now. Yeah, no, that's pretty cool. What about you, Doug? Um, yeah, I'm I'm same with Joe. I do do watch Josh Bridgman as well. Um, from an educational standpoint, but I think also just from a influencer standpoint, I, I enjoy his character. Um, he's he's definitely got things going in the right direction for him and I think it's something that I look up to um, being an online coach he, he he does well in that um, he trains hard which is something I can relate to um, and generally just pretty pretty chill guy um, also in terms of I know you guys kind of watch a few things based on how the video is I touched on that before but um, TM cycles um, he's definitely someone who does well in, like I said, business training, but also just is very passionate about the vlogs. He put, puts in a lot of effort into it and it's just very clean um, transition from t transition. It's, it's just very, very cool. Um, yeah, you and obviously, you Phoenix it. Fitness. Hey, get that in there. <laughs> uh, um, I think you yeah, no, it's a mixture. Him cycles. He's, yeah, he's a, a good YouTuber actually. I like his Instagram as well. Yeah, he had no. He, I, I sent you. It was one edit in a video. Um, I said, "Gonna do that." <laughs> where he, he flicked it to, he flicked the camera from like a a bathroom mirror down to a smaller mirror and then back up again in like one fluid motion, and he changed costume, changed outfit, and yeah. it was just like, "How is that the same video?" It was so so swift. It was yeah. That's was really the sort cool. of stuff I love because then you try and learn different transitions like that and just try to make your video a little bit more interesting because it, it can get a bit samey if you're just watching someone talk to a camera for half an hour because youtube is just recycled content at the end of the day isn't it people just mm. talking about the same sort of stuff a lot of the time so how can you actually make that a little bit more engaging and interesting it's by throwing in a bit more uh yeah interesting That's transitions what I and used angles. To love about max's channel was the, the one thing was those door transitions and every time, you know, like I, I had a couple of videos up where I tried to do it and I'd sit in front of the computer like this and try and edit it all together. And I'm like, how does someone do this every 
it takes a long time. Yeah, it took me like two hours to do one door transition. Yeah. I love, well. I love Max's editing as well, because now he's got a new guy editing for him as well. Like his videos are just getting more and more insane. Yeah. Nice. I think we'll round it off there. Um, unless any of you guys have anything you want to quickly add. I think so. No, well, it's been a really good podcast. I've, I've definitely enjoyed um, talking with you guys. Um, and it's been a bit more of a casual one, but it's definitely been, um, yeah, a really nice episode. Yeah. So uh, thank you for coming on, mate. Yeah, no um, worries. And yeah, like Joe said, description uh, in the description box, there will be links to Matt and his social media pages, um, as well as that support group that is on Facebook. Um, yep. But yeah, if you can't find any of that, then do message either of the three of us um, and we'll redirect you in the right way. Yeah, I appreciate that. Any questions or topics for future podcasts, then do f- put them in the description box or send me or Joe a message um, and we'll, we'll get back to you. Apart from that, thanks for I having think, me. I think we're done. See you guys next week. See ya.